Good evening, everybody. How is everybody feeling? Good? Is, it, is anyone hungry? Yeah? I'm excited to see you guys. I'm excited to be here tonight. I'm excited to get into the Word together. I'm excited to break bread together, to worship the Lord, to remember His sacrifice, to commune together with, with Jesus. Um, listen, so I know that because some of you are hungry, there's been some questions circulating. <clears throat> and I'm here to answer them. The questions have been, how long do you think Stephen's going to teach tonight? Do you think it's going to be like... Do you think it's going to be like usual? <laughs> and here's the thing. I'm really excited to get into uh, Jonah. So what I would like to do is finish Joel, Amos, and Obadiah tonight <laughs> before we get into time of communion and, and breaking bread together, if you guys are good with that. I'm just joking. So turn with me to Joel chapter 3. Often, uh, when we have communion nights, when we have specific nights for communion, often we'll take a break from where we've been in the text and we'll just uh, either look at the communion story, look at the Last Supper, or, or we'll just do whatever the Lord has laid on my heart. And as I was praying about that this week, praying about communion service, uh, the Lord brought me to Joel chapter 3 continually because uh, it, it speaks of us being with the Lord. And maybe you don't see it right away, right, right here in this, but hopefully by the end of the night you'll see it. And so uh, starting in, in chapter 3, verse 1, if you guys make your way there, Joel chapter 3, verse 1, uh, you guys know we've been just making our way through this and speaking, uh, looking at what Joel has been speaking to the nation of Israel as he's been prophesying to Israel. And, and remember, I want to just set the context and, and so you guys remember what's going on, that it's in the wake of this terrible locust plague. Right, that has come upon the nation of Israel and decimated Israel. Completely decimated it. And Joel there, being a prophet of God, it's, it's a unique book in the sense that Joel is prophesying from a place of God's judgment, not for God's judgment to come. And so remember, as we were looking at Hosea, Hosea is coming to the nation of Israel and saying, look, repent, stop doing this, because if you don't, God's judgment is coming. And he's talking about Assyria coming upon the northern kingdoms. And speaking of Babylon coming to Judah. Hose, uh, Joel, on the other hand, sees God's hand in judgment in Israel and begins to foretell of God's coming judgment at the end of the age. Remember, the theme of Joel is the day of the Lord. And over and over again, Joel says that the day of the Lord is at hand. It's near. It's at the door. It's ready. It's coming. It's here. And so what Joel is doing is he's looking at this locust plague and he sees through the locust plague to the coming judgment at the end of the age. He sees the final days. He sees this last pouring out of God's wrath upon the world and upon the nation of Israel. And the point of it is to bring Israel back into covenant relationship with the Almighty. Right? That's his plan. That's been his plan forever. Has God cast off his holy people Israel? Definitely not. Right? And so when we come to uh, chapter 3, verse 1, it says... For behold, in those days and at that time. Now, if we, if we come to this, I can't, I can't come to it without looking back, right? Because it's saying in those days and at that time. Well, what days and time is it speaking of? He gives us a, a little bit more of, a, of an understanding here when he says, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. But what I want to do is look back to verse 28 of chapter 2. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heaven and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord is calls. The Lord calls. Now this is an awesome section of scripture. Now, when you look at verses twenty-eight 
through 29, you recognize that Peter quotes this, right? On the day of Pentecost, as the people who are gathered together there and they hear, they see the Holy Spirit come, they hear the men there that were filled and, and baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, they hear them speaking in tongues, everyone there hears it in their own language and they're wondering, what is this? So they're, they're wondering, what, what's going on? And some people are saying, oh, they're just drunk. Remember what Peter stands up and he says, look, these men aren't drunk, as you say, but this is what the prophet Joel spoke of. And he quotes this, that he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh. This is, this is the coming of that dispensation that God has been speaking of now for a, for a couple thousand years. Right? I mean, this, this prophecy was written 835 years before the coming of Christ. Around that, around that, it's really hard to date specifically, but around 800 and some odd years, one of the oldest prophets, one of the earliest prophets speaking, and he says that God's going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. And then on the day of Pentecost, as the, as the disciples had been waiting there in Jerusalem for the coming of power, from the, for, the, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as, as the Holy Spirit falls upon them there, Peter speaks up and says, this is what Joel was talking about. Now when you read this, you come to recognize that it's not a full fulfillment of what Joel was talking about. It's that partial, it's that beginning work of this dispensation of grace, this pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. We've seen that happen. Look, we are results of that sitting here right now. If you're sitting here, it's because the Holy Spirit has come upon you. If you're sitting here, it's because the Holy Spirit has rescued you. The Holy Spirit has come into you and sealed you into the day of redemption. But then he goes on to speak about these end times again. These last days, the day of the Lord. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. The great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. Listen to that. Deliverance. It's not salvation. It doesn't say that salvation is going to come. Salvation has come. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord right now, today, where we stand, will be saved. If you turn to the Lord, no matter what your circumstance, no matter where you've been, no matter what your life has looked like up until this point, if you turn to the Lord with your heart and you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Salvation has come. But he says that in these days, in the day of the Lord, there's going to be deliverance where? In Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Why? That's an, that's, that's an interesting statement, right? It's an interesting statement for Joel to make here. Because you've got to think, for religious Jews, as they read this, they think, well, we are saved. We've inherited salvation because we're seed of Abraham, Right? We are delivered from the world. We are going to see God face to face. They, they believe all of that. But they, what they don't realize, and, and what Joel didn't necessarily specifically lay out for them, is they were going to reject God and for 2,000 years be wandering again in the, in the wilderness without Him. And yet God is going to come and He's going to plant His foot on the Mount of Olives right there in Jerusalem. He's going to split it in two. And He's going to gather His people unto Himself. As Zechariah says that they're going to look upon Him whom they have pierced. In fact, Zechariah says that they're going to look upon me whom they have pierced. And they're going to mourn for him. And it's at that moment that Jesus rides again to earth and he sets his foot on the Mount of Olives and he splits it in two and he speaks to the gates to raise them up and he walks through to deliver Jerusalem. Deliverance is going to come. Now it says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. So, so think about what's going on here. He's speaking of the day of the Lord, speaking of the great and awesome day of the Lord, the day that Jesus again comes to earth and puts his foot on earth again. It, it's a separate, a separate moment, a separate event than the rapture of the church where he calls the church up unto himself into the clouds and thus we shall always be together with the Lord. Therefore we comfort one another with these words. This is a separate event where Jesus comes and he puts his foot on on the earth again. The great and awesome day of the Lord, the day of judgment, where Jesus comes to judge the nations. And he's going to get into that in chapter 3. So in those days when he brings back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. Now this is interesting because it happened after 
the Babylonian captivity, right? After Babylon came in and captured Judah and, and took them away into captivity into Babylon, they were then allowed under the reign of Cyrus to go back to Jerusalem. But here, this is speaking of something further, something yet future from that. Joel is looking to the end of the age, and he's talking about bringing back again the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. And so, he says, In those days, in the great and awesome day of the Lord, when the Lord is pouring out His wrath on the earth, when He's coming to deliver the nation of Israel, in that day, at that time, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there. Now, here, if you have the King James, it says, I'll plead with them there. I think a better translation is that he's going to enter into judgment with the nations there. Okay, so it says, in the day that he gathers Jerusalem back into the Holy Land, in the great and awesome day of the Lord, when he brings them for deliverance back to Jerusalem, that at that time he's also going to call all the nations, all the nations of the earth together, all nations, and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now it's interesting because the valley of Jehoshaphat, the only place that you find that term is in the book of Joel. Nowhere else in the Bible does it talk about the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's kind of hard to lay your finger on it. There's no specific valley called the valley of Jehoshaphat. In fact, it's the valley of Armageddon. It is the valley of Armageddon. The, the word Jehoshaphat just mean, means Jehovah judges. And so he says he's bringing all the nations of the earth together into the valley of judgment. He's bringing them all together at the same time that he comes to deliver who? Israel. He brings all the nations of the earth into the valley of Armageddon for judgment. And I will enter into judgment with them there. For what? Listen, this is interesting. On account of my people, my heritage, Israel. That's what they're being judged according to. So he's bringing the nations of the earth together to the valley of Armageddon to sit in judgment over them. And it's according to his people, Israel. So he'll, on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for, a, for wine that they may drink. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me, swiftly and speedily I will return your retaliation upon your own head, because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my prized possessions. Also, the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks that you may remove them far from their borders. Now listen, this is amazing. This is interesting, right? Because God says that at the end of the age, in the last day, the great and awesome day of the Lord, when He comes back to earth, when He causes there to be deliverance for the people of Israel, He's also going to ga gather all the nations of the earth together into the valley of judgment, into the valley of, of, of Jehoshaphat, and there He's going to judge them according to the way they treated Israel. Now, I love that because... God has never, the people of Israel have, have never not been God's people. Listen, even in their rebellion, even in the way they have cast off God, even in the way they rejected Jesus, even in the way national Israel is still not in recognition of, who, of the Messiah, the way that they've, they've committed spiritual adultery against the true and living God, like we read about in Hosea. By the way, that hasn't ceased. They've continued to do that. Even in all of that, He's long-suffering. He's gracious. He's loving. And He has a plan for the nation of Israel. He has a plan for His people. Now listen, there is no way, there is no way you can read the book of Joel and come to the conclusion that the church has replaced Israel. It's, it's actually impossible. Unless you allegorize the whole book. Unless you take the whole book and make an allegory out of it and say, well, it's just symbolism, it just means this or that. If you take it for what it says, if you take it literally, you'll recognize that God has a plan 
for the nation of Israel that has yet to be accomplished. It hasn't been done. When do you remember in, in, in any history book ever that you've studied where all the nations of the earth were gathered together in the valley of Armageddon in Israel? Where God sat in judgment over the people of the world for the way they treated Israel. It's never happened. It's never happened. This is still yet future. That's why I can say that Joel is looking past this Babylonian captivity. God is look, uh, Joel is looking past when the people come back from the nation of Babylon back into Jerusalem and rebuild the city. He's looking past all of that to a day where God sits in judgment over the nations. He's going to gather them together. Now listen, this is amazing. It says, On account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, right? That's part of the charge against the nations, that they've scattered the people out of the land that was given to His chosen people, the land of Israel, that He, that he set apart for His chosen people, Israel. They've scattered them out of the land. And now listen to this. They have also divided up my land. God said it belongs to him. He set the borders for the nation of Israel and, and he said that's the land that he's given them as their inheritance. That's the land flowing with milk and honey. This was the promised land. Then the nations have come in enacting God's judgment on the nation of Israel and yet they're going to be judged for what they've done to Israel. That they've divided up God's land. His name is on it. It belongs to him. Not only does the whole universe belong to God, but specifically the nation of Israel is God's chosen land. It is the promised land to his promised people, to his covenant people. And as a result, as the nations have come in and divided it, he's going to judge them for it. They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Now think about that. What God is saying is that they've treated the people of his nation, the people of the nation of Israel, they've treated them as nothing. Like they mattered not. Like they had no worth. They traded a boy for payment as a har for a harlot. Think about that. They sold a girl for wine that they may drink. That's how little the people of the world have thought about the nation of Israel. And I want you to think about throughout history how the nations, how the people of the world have persecuted the Jewish people. And I'm not ashamed to say that even the church in times past have persecuted the nation of Israel, have persecuted the Jews. But God said it won't go without judgment. He still has a plan. He still loves them. They're still chosen. They're still sanctified and set apart. We live now in this era, this dispensation of the grace of God, where anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, and they're added to the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ, but the nation of Israel is the wife of the Father. They have a covenant with Him. And if uh, you've been in premarital counseling with me at any time in the past, which some of you have, you'll know how strongly I think of covenants. That they are unbroken. That when God makes a covenant with someone, it cannot be broken. Because He's a God that never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that means if He makes promises to Israel, He is faithful to fulfill them. Now, listen, that's important for you and I tonight. Because if God could break his promises to Israel, then that means he could break his promise to you. Listen, God has said that you are clothed in his righteousness, that he's washed you in his blood, that now he sets you apart from the world and he calls you a son and a daughter, an heir to the kingdom of heaven. And if all of that's true, but he could break his promise to Israel at any point, then he could break that promise to you. But he is a God who cannot lie. And he changes not. And so, the fact that we trust him to be faithful to the promises that he's made us, we can know for sure that he's faithful to the promises that he's made to the nation of Israel. And so in verse 4 he continues, he says, Indeed, what, do you have to, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Philistia? If you have the King James, it says Palestine there, which is interesting because in 70 AD when Titus Vespasian comes in and he uh, conquers Jerusalem and overthrows Israel and he destroys the temple and ransacks the city. He changes the name of Israel to 
Philistia, really, to Palestine, Palestina. And really, it was, it was a knock on the Jews because it, it was like really calling this the nation of the Philistines, which were the eternal enemies of, of the nation of Israel. And so he renames the nation of Israel uh, Philistia or Palestina. And so here he's saying, what have I to do with you? What have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me, swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your own head. I love that. He's saying, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> that's, that's how I read this, right? God is saying, I'm coming again to deliver my people Israel, and I'm judging all the nations of the earth, bringing all the nations of the earth into the valley of judgment, and there, what are you going to do? Retaliate against me, the God of the heavens and the earth, the God who breathed all things into creation, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who upholds all things by the power of his might? What are you going to do with me? What are you going to do against me? You're going to retaliate against me? If so, then I'll return your retaliation upon your own head. Because... You have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my prized possessions. I love that. It's amazing. Now, do you think God, who's enthroned in glory in heaven, has any need of silver and gold? Of course not. But he's calling the things that they ransacked and took out of the temple, the things that they took away from the temple of God, he's calling that his silver. His gold, it belongs to God. And then he says, you took into your temples my prized possessions. They're his. He's saying, you didn't take this from Israel. You didn't divide up Israel's land. You didn't take their holy articles. You took my stuff. It belonged to me. Now, what I find amazing about that is when God gave David the plans for the temple, when God gave the plans for the articles of the temple and the things that would go in there, they were a rep, an earthly representation of something that is in the throne room of God. It belongs to Him. The things that are, are, were in the temple, the things that they created and formed for the temple, the things that God gave them specific talent to be able to make, were an earthly representation of a heavenly reality. Look, Israel knew that. They knew that those things didn't belong to them. They were God's. They belonged to the Father in heaven. They belong to Jehovah God. And so God said He's going to judge the people because they took away His prized possessions, His treasures, and they put them into their own temples. Verse 6, Also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks that you may remove them far from their borders. Now in verse 7 He says, Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your retaliation upon your own head. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah. And they will sell them to the Sabians. Uh, it, it gives, it's really Sheba there. To, the, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken. Verse 9, proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you, all you nations, and gather together all around. Now, verses 9, uh, really through 13, are exciting verses for me. Really, this whole chapter is an exciting chapter. Remember, what is the theme of the book of Joel? It's the day of the Lord, right? Here, we're speaking of the the great and awesome day of the Lord when Jesus comes back to earth and he gathers all the nations for judgment into the valley of Jehoshaphat, right? Now, it's not really so much of a trial that is going to be set up in the valley of Armageddon. If you guys have spent any time studying the Minor Prophets, if you've spent any time studying Revelation, uh, you'll recognize that the judgment that God is speaking of here is war. He's coming to judge and to make war. It's not a trial. It's a sentencing. And so, who is speaking here? This is important. I want you to remember the context. Remember, never take any verse out of context. So, who is speaking here in verse 9? Proclaim this among the nations. 
It's God. God is speaking to Joel, right? God is speaking to His holy people. And He's saying, proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. To where? To Jerusalem. Let them come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Let them come up to the valley of Armageddon. Beat your, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. It's the, it's the exact opposite of what we have in Isaiah. Now what's interesting is, here we're talking about the great and awesome day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the judgment of God, and that's in stark contrast to the kingdom age, to the messianic kingdom, where people will take their, their swords and they'll beat them into plowshares, and their spears and they'll beat them into pruning hooks, and there will be peace on earth. Here, there's judgment. He's saying, get ready. Get ready for war. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. We've talked about it often. But before you became a Christian, you were at war with God. You're at enmity with Him, which means you're at odds with Him. You're pursuing war against God. And the whole world, the, the system of the world right now, is pursuing war with God. The fact that they have breath in their lungs, that means... It's God's common grace that's being poured out on them right now. But there is a day where God answers their call to war. And this is the day, this great and awesome day of the Lord. And here he's saying, look, you've pursued war against my people. You've pursued war against me. So here I am and get ready. Get ready for war. Get Beat your plowshares into swords, your pruning hooks into spears, and let even the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Now, remember, this is very interesting. Who is speaking here? God. God is speaking, okay? It is Yahweh, Jehovah God, from heaven, speaking to His servant Joel, and through Joel, speaking to the nation of Israel and saying, tell all the nations this, proclaim it among the nations. Then, at the end of verse 11, you have, cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. And then, in verse 12, let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Again, it's God speaking, right? But we have this crazy thing in verse 11 where it says, cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. But wait a minute. I thought God was speaking here. What? We have this interrupted context. If it's anyone else speaking other than God, God is speaking in verses 9 and 10 at the beginning of 11. Then in verse 12, it's still God speaking because He says, I will sit there in judgment. But then, at the end of verse 11, it says, Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Now, if you're a student of the Word, you know this. That any time you have LORD in all caps in your Bible, it's not the word Elohim, Adonai. It is Jehovah. It is Yahweh. It is the covenant name of God. And so, I heard uh, Bart Ehrman, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. Uh, if you are, don't, if you're not, don't worry about it. You're not missing anything. He is a New Testament scholar who is an unbeliever. Okay? He's, he's an atheist or an agnostic, but he's a New Testament scholar. And he says that the idea of a trinity, the idea of the Godhead was an invention of the later Christians after the first century. They invented that later on. But I, I heard... Uh, uh, a guy named Michael Heiser comment on that and rebut that, and he said, that can only be said by someone who is completely ignorant of the Old Testament. Because this Trinitarian doctrine, the, the doctrine of a triune God, is found in the Old Testament, which is why first century believers could believe that Jesus was God, and the Father was God, and the Holy Spirit was God. They could believe it because it speaks of it throughout the whole Old Testament. And right here, you have... Jehovah God speaking from heaven, the Father speaking from heaven, and then he turns and says, cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Yahweh. 
He says it to Jesus. He says it to the Son. He looks to the Son and He says, cause your mighty ones to go down there. It's almost as if God is watching from heaven. He turns to the Son and says, it's time. Let's do it. Go. Let the nations be wakened up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Come to the valley of judgment. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down. For the wine press is full. The vats overflow. For their wickedness is great. Now, remember I said that Joel chapter 3 applies directly to us right here, right now for communion. How? Turn me to Revelation chapter 19. Remember what Jesus says at the Last Supper where he institutes the communion meal. What he says to his disciples there, he says, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you, right? And then he institutes the Lord's Supper, the communion, and he says, I won't drink this cup again until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. In Revelation chapter 19, we have a different perspective of the same event. Okay, It's the same event that is being described here in Joel chapter 3. It's the same event that's being described in Psalm chapter 2. In, in, in Psalm 2. It's the same event, but here it's from a heavenly perspective in Revelation chapter 19. It says, After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are His judgments because He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And He has avenged on her the blood of His servants shed by her. Again, they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you, all you His servants and those who fear Him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he has said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren, who have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, many diadems, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now, this is important. Look back with me for just a second and remember the context. Stay in, stay in Revelation chapter 19, but remember the context of what it just says right there. That he sees heaven opened up, who, and behold, on a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Who is that? That's Jesus. His name is the Word of God. And then it says, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Remember back in Joel chapter 3 where it said, Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Here, this is Jesus. Heaven is opening up and he's riding on a white horse back to earth to judge and to make war. And those arrayed in fine linen, the armies of heaven, are following him. In the context of Revelation chapter 19, who are those arrayed in fine linen? 
It is the bride of Christ who has made herself ready. She's robed in fine linen. She's been allowed to be robed in fine linen, which are the righteous acts of the saints. It's us. It's us. We're standing there in heaven with God, a robed in fine linen, pure white, without spot, stain, or wrinkle. And as heaven opens up, the Father looks at the Son and says, Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Yahweh. And Jesus rides to earth on a white horse, and we follow him. And for what reason? To redeem the people of Israel back to a covenant relationship with God and to judge and to make war. All the nations of the earth are gathered together there in the valley of Armageddon waiting to make war against the Holy One who sits on the throne. The Holy One who is faithful and true and in righteousness He judges and makes war. Listen to the description of Jesus. This is far from the shampoo model with a lamb over His shoulders, right? This is the God we served. This is the God we serve. This is the God we follow into battle. This is the God who has called us and set us apart as warriors for the kingdom of God. The God who now calls us right now ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading for, us, for them through us. We're going to the people of the world to preach truth, to preach righteousness so that they may be saved. But there is a day when the door of grace closes. And then we come arrayed in fine linen, following Jesus. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many diadems, royal crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's who we serve, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Do you hear the description there of who Jesus is? Now, I want you to remember that not long before this, in the book of Revelation, John is there, and a scroll is held in the hand of the Ancient of Days. The Father is holding a scroll. And he says, who is worthy to open the scroll or to loose its seals? No one was found in heaven or on earth or under the earth who is worthy to open the scroll. And John wept bitterly. He sobbed. And then someone said, don't weep. For the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the scroll. And he turns and he looks and he sees a lamb as though it had been slain. Jesus still bearing the marks of the crucifixion. Jesus reminding us that he bled and died. The king of kings, the Lord of lords, bled and died and endured the wrath of God poured out in full on him on the cross so that he could cry out in a loud voice at the end, it is finished, paid in full, nothing else needs to be done. He came to redeem for himself a bride. And then here in Revelation 19, we see the culmination of that event where we stand arrayed in fine linen before the Father, before the Ancient of Days, we're presented as a bride, the perfect bride of Christ without spot or wrinkle, and we ride back to earth with our King, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. And Paul said, as often as you do this, as often as you take communion, you proclaim His death until He comes. It's more than a memorial. When we come to the table tonight and we partake of the communion elements, it's more than just a memorial. Do you realize that right now, He's here with you. He walks among the churches. He walks among the seven lampstands. Jesus is here right now. It's more than a memorial. He's with us in it. We are proclaiming His death until He comes. Who do we proclaim His death to? It's only us in this room. We proclaim His death to principalities and powers. We proclaim His death to the universe. We proclaim His death and say, it's by this that you were defeated. It's by this that now death has no power over us. That we stand in the righteousness of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, sealed until the day of redemption. And there's a day soon and very soon when He's coming back for us. And we're going to stand 
in the throne room of God and praise Him face to face for the things that He did. And we're remembering that tonight. So listen, as we gather together, as we come to the table, as we partake of the elements, I want you to remember what He saved you from, yes, important. But more important, what has He saved you to? He saved you to commune with Him perfectly forever. It starts tonight. It starts now. It starts right now. He's already saved you to this eternal life. You've entered into your eternity together with Him. You've started on this eternal journey together with the Lord now. Soon bodily, spiritually, we've been exalted in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're seated and thrown in glory with Him, in Him, He in us. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so when we come to the table tonight, remember that that you've been saved to commune with a holy God, to break bread with a holy God, to sit in His presence, to have fellowship with Him. Koinonia, that Greek word koinonia, it's, it's an interesting word, it's an amazing word. It's the sharing of things in common. It's an intimate fellowship, an intimate sharing of things in common. You've been saved and redeemed and set apart to have fellowship with the Almighty God. What do you have in common with Him? Just Jesus, that's it. It's only in Him, it's only by Him. It's through Him and for Him that you live. So I'm going to call Corey back up. Listen, guys, 30 minutes early, just for you. I'm going to call Corey back up. We're going to sing some songs together. We're going to worship the Lord. I've said this before, but I think it's important that I say it again. That when we worship God, we are sending it forward into eternity. There are many things that we do in our life, day to day, that are temporal. That are just for today. And they're gone. We'll We'll never do them again. They don't matter for anything. But there are eternal things that we can do. That we can... Praise God. We can worship Him. That's eternal. We can have fellowship and communion with Him. That's eternal. And we can have fellowship and communion with each other. That is eternal. We'll be together forever in eternity. So you better start liking each other soon. Listen, as we lift our voices up to the Lord, as you feel led, come down, get the communion elements, take them back to your seat, and then we'll take communion together. Just hold them until we finish uh, worshiping, and then we'll take communion together. But before we do that, let's pray. Lord, we just look forward to that day when you come. Father, help us to remember. Help us to remember that we stand here today as the redeemed because of the sacrifice that you made, an infinite sacrifice. You traveled an infinite distance, Lord, that we cannot even begin to imagine. We cannot even begin to comprehend, and yet you stepped down from glory to die for us. But Lord, your word says that you also live, that you ever live, seated at the right hand of God to make intercession for us. Lord, you're praying for us even now. So Father, I pray that as we lift up our voices to you, that it would be a sweet-smelling aroma, Lord, that it would be a blessing. Lord, that you would remind us of, uh, of what you've done, the sacrifice that you've made your body and your blood. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that uh, has wandered, strayed, fallen into sin, I pray that you would move their heart to repentance, that they would come to you bare and naked before you, confess it, and come to your table and partake of communion with you. Just thank